Welcome, everybody, to the Let's Talk Computer Science podcast dedicated to talking about the past, present, and future of computer science. This podcast, of course, is made possible by our friends at Rex Academy. Be sure to check out their amazing CS platform, including courses on cybersecurity, app development, and artificial intelligence. Yes, it's real. Uh, don't have a teacher? Not a problem. Rex is now providing instructors as part of their platform, so be sure to check them out at rex.academy. Today, uh, I'm excited to invite back on the Let's Talk CS podcast, Rochelle Danae Poth. She's actually been on the podcast when Sandy was hosting it, and I've had her on, I don't know, Rochelle, uh, three, four of my yeah. other podcasts. Um, <laughs> let's just say she's a favorite guest of mine. So, of course, having her having her on this show uh, would be great. And since her field is really around computer science, this makes her a perfect guest for the show. She's a teacher of emerging technologies uh, up there in Pittsburgh, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but many other things. She's also a consultant. I've seen her speak. I've seen her doing sessions. Uh, puts out a lot of great content, especially now we, as we'll get into AI a little bit later. Uh, lots of interesting takes on that. And she's a practitioner. So she uses these things every day in her work, working with kids uh, there in Pittsburgh. So uh, welcome to the podcast, Rochelle. Well, thank you, Carl. It's always good to be <laughs> chatting with you on a podcast, uh, whether we're like this or in person too. But thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, I guess it's true. I guess we've done some in person too. So this is good. Yeah. I think you now are the record holder officially as of this podcast. You have been the guest on most of my podcasts more than any other guest. So <laughs> you get it. a gold star. Finally, finally winning yeah, at something. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we get a t-shirt when you get to like the 10th guest and we'll send you a t-shirt. Um, so give me a little, first, before we get into uh, a little bit of CS, tell me a little bit about your origin story. Like tell our listeners what got you kind of excited about computer science, about educational technology. Maybe it was something you did as a student or as a teacher. Yeah, it was uh, it's kind of a lot of different things. You know, I think originally it goes back and I won't say what year it was, but I, we'll just say that I was in and I may or may not have sent you a picture of me at, at one point from back then. But it was when the computers were coming into the classroom and uh, my school had gotten two different computers and they really didn't do much. I mean, you could program them to do some whatever it was that you created. And I was just fascinated by it, like just making kind of like, you know, if this, then that kind of programs and and writing my name or having people respond. And I couldn't wait to go home and do that. And then uh, I remember my parents purchasing a computer. And so then, you know, at that point it could do more, but I was just always fascinated by technology itself. Uh, truth be told, I didn't have a lot of like normal board games or things like those fun games as a kid, you know, I had like the strategic games. And then of course, with the technology, like those like thinking kind of games, educational games. So that's just kind of my upbringing. And then in the classroom, I remember being in, in college and, you know, when email and yeah. I'm like, wait, I can send a, a message to somebody like, why don't I just walk across the room and talk to them? But then just how much things have changed. But then flash forward to being in my classroom as a language teacher also, looking for opportunities for students to practice, you know, Spanish that wasn't just like packets and worksheets and all of those things like that I had been doing for years in my classroom, but that I also had experienced as a student. So, I mean, it's all of that, but just the fascination of what we're capable of now with, I mean, no matter what we're doing, whether it's personal lives or professional lives, but being able to help to prepare students, of course, we need language educators and I want them to learn Spanish, but realistically, I have to help them to build skills they need for whatever they do later on in life. And that's most likely going to come through skills and technology and the skills they can build because of, you know, the facil facilitation of learning through different tools and methods that we choose. And it's interesting as a language teacher, I hear a lot of, you know, the response of like, well, we just have translators. So, you know, we'll use our phones for this. And, and my wife is traveling to Italy in a few weeks and she's been doing Duolingo pretty heavy to try to learn Italian as fast as she can, but she's, you know, struggling with it. She's like, well, I can use a translator. And, yeah, in some ways, sure, the technology can help with some of that. But I mean, almost like with the AI discussion about we'll never need to write again. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts as a language teacher? Like, oh, you know, we could just skip forward to this magical part where we can put an ear pod in and it'll basically decode everything for you. Uh, we're not there anywhere close, but uh, and it hasn't. And I feel like yeah. we've been talking about this for maybe a six, seven years, and it's still not there. What are your thoughts on all that? Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's one of the biggest things as a language teacher for years doing the battle with the translators. And uh, it's like, I would tell the students so often, you know, don't you dare use it, like, don't use the translators and stuff. And, and the same with things like digital citizenship, you know, for, for a lot of people, they say, like, don't go on social media, but instead of like saying the don't, it's like, okay, let's look at it. When is it beneficial? So like, 
Your wife's going to Italy. She doesn't have a language educator. She has to learn the language quickly. Okay, we're going to use a tool like Duolingo, which is great because it's in your hand. Personalized, has AI built into yeah. it. Uh, but, or in the ear, you know, if you have to like translate quickly, like that's awesome. Like that is really, really cool stuff. But you still need to understand like human emotion and context and slang and all of those other types of things that, uh, you know, the technology doesn't necessarily understand. And I love giving examples of like, when I got my degree in um, translation, this is years ago, and there, there were machine tools already available. And it didn't understand if I wanted, if I said I want a bat for my birthday. And I've told this story so many times, like, do Fine I want bat. a bat for baseball or do I want like the other kind of a bat? And you would probably assume like, oh, Rochelle wants a baseball bat. Well, what if I actually didn't? What if I wanted the other bat? But a computer may or may not know that or uh, just the way that we speak. And so understanding, you know, parts of speech, slang, different variations in the language and how it's used in different places, you're not necessarily going to get that with a translator. And <laughs> the students, you know, they'll take their shortcuts for everything. I mean, it's not just like, it doesn't matter what it is. There's a way to find it even back in the, you know, pre uh, chat GPT and all these things. Like I could pay somebody to write my essay for me, you know, do all of those things. So it's like, you still need the underlying skills to communicate because technology might not work. It might not have the words that you need. You know, there might be some problem uh, that you're still going to have to have those skills to be able to communicate and interact with people. And that comes from the conversations, from reading natural expressions and, and all of that that evolves. I, you know, I spoke to a friend of mine who's a, a so. college professor at USC recently, and he said he kind of made it akin to like with, with well, chat GPT, like doing your work for you, but similar to like the calculator, you know, when it came in, I'm sure math teachers like, oh, we're done. No. You know, it's just going to get you to deeper learning. What he told his students, now these are college kids, but he basically asked them, like, why do you think we test you on all this stuff? Why do you think we assess you? And it's not just about learning the content, but it's to train your brain. He said, it's like if you're running a marathon and one one student is basically practicing every day and working out and making sure they're getting their miles deeper and longer um, and, you know, stretching and doing all the exercise they need to do. And the other one's just taking the bus every day, the 26 miles. And then all of a sudden the marathon comes and the one jumps on they both jump on the starting line and one can't basically do it because their brain is just not had the mental practice. What you're giving those students in language is like, you're saying all the intonation and the different things that a translator will never be able to offer them, at least not any time in the foreseeable future. So again, going back to that training, I like that. Right. What are some other things? How are you in your current role? Cause you do other things besides just language. I know in your school there, what are some other things you're doing around computer science right now? Yeah. Yeah, so we, the uh, STEAM course that I teach, it's it's called What's Next Emerging Technology, but we cover, I mean, the start, the start of the year, it's, I pull out old technology, <laughs> cell phone pager? pagers, you name it. They're like, what are those things? VCO, it's like, it's so funny when they come in, they see me with like a rotary phone yeah. and like, that's the coolest <laughs> Can thing Can they ever. use like, it? That's the question. How to use it, but um, back in the day, they try and they're like, my fingers hurt. I'm like, yep, that's, yeah, yeah. So we, you know, we look at that, we look at digital citizenship and then throughout the year, it's kind of broken into chunks. I don't necessarily yeah. follow a certain pattern because it's emerging tech. So we know I get some news report. I'm like, Hey, let's talk about this today. But we do spend, I think a bulk of what we spend our time in is uh, augmented virtual reality, artificial intelligence. And then we do a lot with coding and a lot of my students, you know, some of them will say, well, you know, I don't know why I have to learn this, or I'm not going to be any good at this, or I'm never going to use, you know, all of those things that we hear in a lot of our classes. And so I try to give them as many opportunities, trying different tools and platforms so that they can experience it and understand it. Because the reality is like, there's this huge number of jobs that are going to be available and not too many, I mean, they're available now, but not too many years from now. And if they don't have that opportunity, I mean, beyond right. like, I used to do the hour of code. I was like, yay, I did my hour of code in December. And like, that was it. And I didn't think that I could do anything like that in my Spanish class. And we can't, I mean, you might have to be a little bit creative depending on what you teach, but you know, with my students, we go through a lot of different types of coding resources. Uh, we talk about computer science, we read articles, they get involved in discussions. And, you know, it's kind of funny that some of the students have said, I had one, one student that said, I really hate that I'm so good at this. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, because I, I don't want to code. I don't really like coding, but wow. I'm able to do it. I mean, we're talking like Python. I mean, beyond, like eighth grade Python, like just like nothing. And so for me, it's exciting because, I mean, I don't know all the things, obviously. I might pretend. And I think that's the thing, too, that teachers, we always feel like we have to be the expert. But uh, I, 
we don't, I'm not. And so when you have a kid like this, that you can, they can find something and they can just go and excel at their own pace, even if they don't want to do it, but then seeing that they're good at it, like that helps them on so many different levels. And it's great for me to learn from them, but I get a lot of different you know, tools and different robots and things in my classroom that I think, how in the world am I going to have time to figure this out? But I just give it to them. And they find something that like they connect with, that it meets their interests, their needs. And if they don't like it, there's plenty of other options out there. So um, I just try to create like this space where they feel comfortable taking those risks and when, where they realize like that you, I might not have the answer that you need. So you're going to have to push through it and build those skills or rely on collaborating with your classmates too. But uh, it, it's, we have a ton of fun more recently now, like oh, the end fun. of the year, we've been doing podcasts. So that's like a first for me diving in and it has been fantastic, but some of them are actually talking about some of these topics in their podcasts, like what they like about coding, for example, or why they need certain skill sets. So it's been really neat to kind of, I like that too, as a, as a, pra as a practice and reflection, year. giving them the opportunity to actually generate some sort of content around reflecting on what they've been learning in the classroom. What are, are, what are you noticing kids gravitating toward the most? Is it just coding? Is it gaming? Is it robotics? Is it AI, VR? What do you, are there any trends in your classroom? Like give us, give us the pulse of the seventh grade student right now. Like what are they, what are they jonesing about? Or is it all Zelda? <laughs> Yeah. Oh gosh. No, you know, they really have loved this podcast. Oh, good. I think it might be, I mean, podcasting and everything about the AI and the chat GPT, they, they really like the AR VR, but the podcasting, it's something that I had done very minimally in the prior years, but this year I decided to dive in and teach them all about like branding and creating a business and designing a logo. And, and I, I pulled, I had them go into separate rooms and I pulled them into StreamYard and I showed them like what that looked like. Uh, just because I know that they're on, on their phones, they're on social media and they're interested, you know, in creation. So I thought this might be a really good thing at the end of the year to get them if they want to do their own. And I have some students who said, you know, I don't, I'm not comfortable doing this. And I looked and they, they created on Spotify, you know, for podcasters now, they have like seven episodes and, you know, some of them have transitions and music and everything. And, but in, within those episodes that they're talking about, like, this is what's happening in my day, or this is the favorite thing I learned about steam or in my steam class this year. Uh, so it's, it's neat to hear them speak about some of these things after knowing what their initial response was to some of those topics throughout there. Like, Oh, we already know everything about augmented virtual reality. I'm like, really? How so? Eh, we got Snapchat. I'm like it's a little <laughs> bit more than Snapchat or, you know, looking at chat GPT and thinking that it's, it's going to know everything. It's going to be perfect. And then I have it write a bio about me that says I already have my PhD. I'm like, Finally. Yes, <laughs> I can quit. I can quit my classes. Like what am I enrolled in this program for? So it's, um, uh, I mean, it's just, it's neat to have that opportunity for me to be able to do a lot of different things, but to also have that experience with them and to kind of get, you know, that, that vibe at the end of the year, like, what are they interested in? Because that helps me to plan for next year also. Uh, but it also gives them a chance, I think, to recognize their own growth and, uh, you know, their strengths in different areas or, or where their curiosity is leading them. Uh, what a, I, what a great class, by the way, I think every school or school district should have at least an opportunity of this. It's almost like you've taken the Google 20% time and said, we're going to make it into a class. It's just like, like you said, here's a news article about this today. Let's discover what is this going to be about? Where is this going to lead us to? And with AI, I'm curious where are the kids at? I mean, I know they, they probably played with it a little bit. I mean, well, or maybe not. I don't know. Are you guys blocking it? What's your, what's your overall, like, give us your, the one minute pitch, AI, good, bad, ugly, <laughs> the future of everything. What? Oh gosh. <laughs> you gave me too many choices in that. And you know me, I can't ever just pick one thing, but uh, I, I think, it, I mean, it, it's good. You have to say that it's good because there are things that it can provide that make life easier in some cases, or it promotes, you know, I mean, we don't, we said a minute, so I can't go into too much of it, but like, if you look at like personalized learning and you're looking at students that are, you know, you give them a game that they're going to play and instead of them all getting the same thing, it's taking all that information and it's creating their own personalized learning path. So you can't, you can't go wrong by that because as a teacher, if that saves me time, then I can see what they did. They can see what they did and I can go have a conversation with them that gives me back more time with them. So like, that's just an example. Uh, if they're using it to just you know, crank out essays as a teacher, like you could tell, like I oh, run yeah. tests where you can see, and you know, the voice of the students, like, cause when you get to know the kids, you know, how they write and how they all, you know, create and all that. But, um, 
I think, you know, we have to embrace it and help them to learn about it because we have to learn about it too. I mean, what can it help us to do? How can it help us change? And sometimes I'm stuck for ideas for projects because I'm like, oh, I feel like I, can, I can't think of anything. So I'll ask ChatGPT, like, give me 20 project ideas. And it might come up with one thing that I actually like and I may not use it, but it might help me to just get past that like roadblock in thought. But it initially, we did use it, uh, you know, I had it up and I had them give me some random names of like animal color, this, that, and create a story. And then they took turns reading it. So in the STEAM class, you know, they're learning about it. They're seeing how it works. And they're also building like speaking skills and confidence because they're reading this story. and They're having fun yeah. with it. Uh, and then I did show them, like I said, about my biography. They're like, you have your PhD. I was like, everything's on the internet is true. So apparently it must be real. It's, it's all real. <laughs> But um, it's just that literacy component too. So I don't know. We'll have to have another podcast episode where we talk all about it. <laughs> I want to know all about the prompts. Yeah. So give me real quick though. I want to know, is there a silly prompt that you've used at any time? Tell, is there anything fun that you can mention on the podcast that you tried? Like, yeah. let me just see what it does if I do this. Give me a quick, give me a quick one. Yeah. So I did this at uh, TCEA, I think it was. I typed in, I wanted it because I was doing a presentation with Brett Salakis. Actually, I had him jo join me nice. for like an NFT blockchain metaverse one. And then the day after that, and, and I don't think I did it in the session with him, but I had those topics and I said, okay, write me a story. I gave it a, a word count about blue Fox, uh, the metaverse, I think NFT I had in there and written in Spanish. So it churned out, you know, all in Spanish, this story. And it had like this fox and its name was this. And it found this green thing or blue thing. And it ended up being an NFT. And it just went blah, 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 blah. So it didn't actually say blah, blah, blah. But then I regenerated it and it had all those components in it. But it was really creative, you know, just to see what it did. And then as it was writing it, you know, I was translating it a little bit for um, the people that were there. But it was just, it was kind of neat to see. I mean, it's scary as a language educator to to see that. But again, sure. if I have a student turning something in like that level two, I'm like, you don't actually learn that in high school. So like, you shouldn't That's even be in this the, class. But the, yeah, you know right away. I think that was, I showed it to some fourth grade students and teachers at a school recently and they the teachers were actually giggling in the back and they were back on their laptops while i was showing the kids they were asking it all sorts of funny questions and then later they started reflecting and like huh i wonder what this is going to mean for me in teaching them i was like well let me ask you something as a 10 year old in your class can you tell them if you could write a 600 word essay on the no no <laughs> right. way and i'm like exactly right. are you really that worried about it i think it's more the high school and the in colleges that are super concerned but like you said it's all about the kids yeah. and you know this change is just like anything else, except that just like social media, we're all learning at the same time the kids are learning it. And remember that back in the, you know, 15, 10 years ago, it was, you know, there's a lot of disruption around it. And I think that's the same right. with this. We're learning it when they're learning it. We're going to figure it out as we go. I know I just noticed uh, Department of Educational Technology just put out something. Um, Christina Ishmael, yeah. we know her. Um, she put something out recently. They're going to be doing a show, I think, or a webinar in June just to talk about their kind of ideas and guidelines and just kind of brainstorming what to do around it. So yeah. who knows where we'll know. go and in, in a year from now or six months when I have you on my next <laughs> podcast, I'm sure um, <laughs> we'll talk about what that yeah. looks like. Uh, but in the meantime, where can people find out more about you and your great work? I'm super consistent. So Twitter, Instagram, uh, my Gmail or my blog site, it's just at R D E N E nine one five. And you can put the dot com and the Gmail with that. If anybody wants to reach out, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not really on TikTok. I mean, I have an account, but yeah, you won't find me <laughs> putting up any any funny videos or anything. At least not yet. But uh, yeah, I would love to connect. I'm I'm on TikTok and I'm starting to use it more as a professional tool, but I'm still far. I'm like you. I'm just kind of dabbling. Yeah. So I'll, mostly because my 14 year old is trying to get into it, and I'm like, all right, I better learn alongside. Right. You know, That's just good. like you were saying with the kids. Yep. Well, uh, thank you, Rochelle, for being a part of Let's Talk Computer Science. And thanks again, of course, to our friends at Rex Academy for making this podcast possible. Be sure to check out their platform at rex.academy. We all know technology will be a part of our future, folks. And as educators and leaders, it's our role to make sure that all students, and I mean all students, have an opportunity in that future as well. This is Carl Hooker signing off. <laughs>